team will request Professor Mujumdar to answer their queries. So uh, by now it's 11.05. Uh, may I request uh, Professor Muitri Bhattacharya to officially introduce Professor, Professor Mujumdar and uh, inaugurate the session. Thank you. A very good morning to everybody. Uh, it's my privilege to welcome Professor Parthaputi Mojumdar at the joint platform of Jagadish Boshu National Science Talent Search and the Academic Trust. And we are really very much happy that Professor Mojumdar, such a renowned orator, uh, is with us today. And it's our pleasure that always we get him with us and Professor Mojumdar is always with very much with JBNS, his scholars. Uh, Professor Mojumdar started his career from Indian Statistical Institute. He graduated from there. And after that, perhaps uh, he was fascinated with biology. And so he moved to US and abroad. And he continued his research and education with biology and uh, so on. And we know then, then that after that, he always uh, continued with biological research, with statistics, and uh, with analytical uh, values. And so I always uh, give him as a put him as an example to inspire our scholars that how statistics can be blended with biology, and statistics can be can aid all the experimental research to analyze the data. Uh, and uh, also, it's a very a matter of pride that Professor Mojumdar has always been very much proactive as a scientist in the scenario of pandemic disease, pandemic uh, situation in India. Uh, from the very beginning of this uh, COVID-19, he was very active uh, to organize the experimental tests, analysis the data, and also for the uh, development of uh, statistical data for the progress of the disease. And nowadays also we have seen him, uh, he is the president of Indian Academy of Science and he has also been very active role for our vaccine development in the future days. Uh, sir, I welcome you from the core of our heart and from JBNSTS platform. And today we are very happy that also the Academic Trust has collaborated with us. Uh, so, sir, uh, please uh, uh, give your lecture for us. Thank you, uh, sir. Thank you. thank you. Thank you, Professor Bhattacharya, for this kind introduction. It's always a delight to speak to your scholars. And I've done that in the past. I'm always uh, very, very happy to speak, speak to them. Um, I know that the audience is kind of heterogeneous, heterogeneous, so the talk will be pitched at various levels. I'm hopeful that everybody will gain something from the talk and uh, know something about uh, the current phase of the pandemic that we are passing through. Uh, before I actually start my talk, I would like to introduce two institutions. I head both of these institutions uh, in the last couple of years or so. I've been doing so. Uh, one institution that most of you would be aware of in, is the Indian Academy of Sciences. And the reason why most of you would be aware of the Indian Academy of Sciences is because the Indian Academy of Sciences, on behalf of all of the three science academies in India, plays a major role in um, promoting uh, research, in promoting scientific temper and research, provides research training. We provide over 1,000, maybe 1,500 summer research fellowships. We have a summer research fellowship program, which is very vibrant. This year, the vibrancy, of course, has become gone down to zero, uh, except that those uh, students who are able to actually work under supervision from home, uh, individuals who are in computing and those computer science and those kinds of um, uh, domains, they are still able to avail of the summer research fellowship program. The others are not. And that's a very sad thing for us. Uh, it is sad. Also, for the reason that none of us who is present here or none of us who is present on this planet right now has ever faced such a situation. The last such pandemic that we had faced, that the world had faced, was in 1918 
It's called the Spanish flu, which is very similar to the present virus that we are um, dealing with. So none of us who is alive today has ever seen what's going on. And that has impacted on the summer research fellowship program of the academy as well. Aside from this, the Indian Academy of Sciences uh, it publishes uh, fantastic journals where uh, provides uh, research outlet to our research uh, findings and does many other things. And I'm not going to go into the details, but to you, the students, the JBNSTA scholars, uh, this is what I would say is that many of you may have actually availed of our summer research fellowship program uh, by word of mouth to do promote the program among um, your, your or children or students of your school, wherever you come from. Uh, and uh, that would be uh, a contribution to our academy. Uh, so this is at the level of uh, college students or high, high school students. But we also have, uh, we thought that it is important for all of us who are in science and who are kind of established in science to provide an outreach or provide training to uh, starting at the school level. So we want to start, we want to catch uh, students early on to provide them with scientific training, the rigor of scientific uh, research, uh, understanding the rigor of scientific research and also building a scientific temper. This is very important in today's world and uh, to have a scientific temper, to be able to look at facts from a scientific point of view, to be able to analyze those from a scientific point of view, with a scientific bend of mind. This is what we um, thought that we would promote. Uh, this was not in the mandate of the Indian Academy of Sciences. So we said that we'll form a trust. The trust uh, is formed with some donations from individuals individual fellows of the academy from the corporate sector, etc. We still try to uh, donate, uh, you know, raise money through donations, etc. And what does the trust do? Among other things, the trust reaches out to uh, school children, primary school children, secondary school children, etc. The high school onwards is dealt with by the uh, Indian Academy of Sciences. So the academy trust does a lot of outreach program again to build scientific temper among children such that they become good citizens, scientifically minded citizens of our country. So this is what the trust does. And the trust uh, collaborates with institutions such as the uh, JBNSTS in promoting science. And that's the reason why today the Academy Trust is actually joined hands with JBNSTS and JBNSTS has organized this program and I'm able to reach out to all of you. So let me thank you for uh, joining this and uh, I will now begin uh, the scientific discourse of my talk. Uh, I've uh, titled my talk as Evolution and Spread of SARS-CoV-2. SARS-CoV-2 is the virus that has created this furore, that's created this pandemic. And uh, I do want to talk about viruses, in particular this virus, and uh, talk about the evolution. And now it's uh, it was a small outbreak in a city called Wuhan in China from where it spread, and it's a, it's a global pandemic today. Uh, so I want to talk about the evolution and spread of this virus. There are some interesting phenomena. Um, so first of all, a disclaimer, I'm not a virologist. Uh, I uh, do not, as a matter of routine, do virology. Virology is the study of virus, viruses, etc. That's not really my field. As a matter of fact, infectious disease is not my field. How did I get into this? I made some or we made some observations and those observations needed some uh, explanation. And that's how we became curious and that's how I got uh, into this and we uh, have some findings which I've which I'm going to uh, share with you a part of those findings have just come out two weeks ago uh, in the Indian Journal of Medical Research in the COVID-19 special issue and uh, another uh, more deeper biological um, findings um, are now in um, review in another journal so I'm going to tell you these two stories primarily the evolution and spread of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, first of all, a few words about viruses. Many of you, those of you who are studying medicine would probably, not probably, would surely know. Uh, but those of you who are studying engineering may know or may not know. I do not know. But uh, uh, it is, it's also common knowledge. It's also um, general knowledge. Uh, viruses uh, are, non are not living beings uh, in the way that we think about living beings. Uh, they cannot reproduce themselves. They cannot even have an independent existence. So uh, these viruses are uh, nucleic acids. Uh, in particular, this, this virus, the SARS-CoV-2, um, is a nucleic acid that's called ribonucleic acid. 
Uh, we also have uh, deoxyribonucleic acid viruses. They are called DNA viruses. But this SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus, meaning that its nucleotide sequence comp comprises four alphabets, A, U, which distinguishes itself from T, which is present in the uh, deoxyribonucleic acid, A, U, G, and C. C, these are the four alphabets, and it's a string of these alphabets. How long is the string if in SARS-CoV-2? It is uh, 30,000 such alphabets. So 30,000 um, nucleotides make up the RNA of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, this is the naked RNA, and uh, it doesn't come in, um, as a, in a naked form. It comes packaged, it comes wrapped in what's called lipids. So these lipids wrap the um, uh, RNA sequence, and that's how the virus presents itself. Yet the virus does not have all the machine, machinery to reproduce, to replicate itself, and so on. So how does it uh, replicate? How does it b increase in numbers, etc.? I'll come to in a moment. The reason why we keep washing our hands with soap is that soap dissolves this lipid layer, and the naked RNA then becomes exposed, and the naked RNA is not very stable. Um, even with you know, strong um, uh, bases and alkalis, it, it just gets cut. So if you um, shear the RNA, then it's no, no longer functional. So that's the reason why we are washing our hands with soap, essentially to dissolve the lipid layer that, that is uh, the wrap of the RNA of the virus. And uh, once we do that, then we get rid of the virus. We essentially kill the virus. Now, I said that the viruses are non-living beings. They cannot reproduce themselves. How do they expand then? Well, the virus for its uh, own life needs to get into a cell. Now, in this particular case, the SARS-CoV-2, the cell that it gets into is, the, is a specific kind of cell in the lung of humans. It also infects other organisms, but not, it's not exactly the same virus. Um, the, uh, this is called a coronavirus, and the reason why it's called a coronavirus, I'm sure that you have seen pictures of it. It's like the flares of the sun, so it's you know, those spikes that are there. Um, so it, it looks like the corona, it looks like the sun flares, so solar flares and so on. Uh, coronaviruses are also uh, present, not just in humans, but in other animals also. And one of the animals where it is present in large numbers or different varieties of coronavirus are the bats. Bats are home to many different kinds of viruses. Uh, we don't understand why bats are home to so many different kinds of viruses. It's estimated that bats are home to about 70 different kinds of viruses. Uh, most other animals would cease to exist if they were home to 70 different kinds of viruses. But uh, there are many uh, theories as to why the virus supports so many viruses, and I'm not going to talk about those. The coronavirus is also one of those viruses that's present in the bats. Um, so how do we know, or, or it's been, it was speculated that the coronavirus that's infecting us now evolved from uh, the bat coronavirus. Now, what do we mean by evolved? Is it the same, exact same coronavirus that is present in the bat, bats that's infecting us? The answer is no. Um, it is uh, similar, but not exactly the same. And how is it similar and not exactly the same? How do we know that? So if you sequence the uh, RNA of a virus, RNA of a virus of the coronavirus that's found in the bat, and the RNA of a virus that's found in the human, um, if these two, if the bat coronavirus is the ancestor of the human coronavirus, you would find alphabet by alphabet in these 30,000, uh, sequence of 30,000 nucleotides, nucleotide by nucleotide, you would find sequence identity. So we find a very large sequence. When we find a very large sequence identity between two different species or two different strains of virus, we would say that one virus is ancestral to the other virus. Again, there are ways and means of finding out which is ancestral to whom. Uh, certainly, nobody will, will believe that, uh, that the bat coronavirus is a descendant of the human coronavirus. Nobody will believe that, right? Because, uh, again, there are uh, statistical ways of de uh, determining this, but uh, the, the bat coronavirus was known much before any human coronavirus was known. So the human coronavirus uh, most likely could not have been uh, an ancestor to the bat coronavirus. Now we know for sure that that isn't true. So the bat coronavirus is likely an ancestor of the human coronavirus. So if we, I said that we do this by looking at sequence identity, 
what is the sequence identity between the bat coronavirus and the human coronavirus? The sequence identity on an average, that is, if we sample many coronaviruses from humans, many coronaviruses from bats, and do pairwise sequencing or pairwise comparison, on an average, the number of nucleotides that are identical is 96%. Of these 30,000 30, nucleotides that there, that there are, if you compare as a position by position, they are identical at 96% of these 30,000 positions. Uh, so they are very, very similar, but not exactly the same. Um, did the, so why did it move from the bat to the human? Uh, the reason why it moves uh, from one species to another, this is called sp crossing the species boundary or zoonotic transfer. I don't want to introduce too many technical words, but there are students of medicine, there are students of biology among the GSTSP scholars. So they are probably familiar with these kinds of terms. The uh, ability to cross the species barrier comes by change of one or more of these nucleotides. So these are change of a nucleotide is called a mutation. So when mutations take place, some specific mutations renders the virus the ability to move from one species and infect another species. Usually that does not happen. So this is called zoonotic transfer and most likely uh, certain mutations gave the bat coronavirus the ability to cross the species boundary and go and infect humans. Did it human, uh, infect humans directly? The, did the bat coronavirus start infecting the human corona, uh, the, the humans directly? Most likely not. Usually there is an intermediate animal that it infects and that intermediate animal comes and infects uh, the human. This is what uh, with, with respect to other viruses also is known. So there was a speculation who may have been, which animal may have been the, uh, the intermediate between the bat and the human. Uh, again, this was just a rendibility. Accidentally, what was found is that about 150 kilometers away from Wuhan, Wuhan is the place where this outbreak took place, and I'll talk about Wuhan a little bit more. Uh, about 150 kilometers from Wuhan, uh, accidentally, two pangolins, these are scaly anteaters, two pangolins um, were found dead and with lots of froth coming out of their mouth. Um, so it was quite clear that something had infected their lungs. And uh, then scientists got into the act and then they said that let's try and get a biopsy, autopsy of the lungs. So they removed the lungs and removed the viruses from the lungs and sequenced them. And lo and behold, uh, these, these were coronaviruses, and the coronaviruses were very similar to both the bat and the human coronavirus. So the uh, current uh, theory, and the theory is not without contest, very recently it's been contested whether the pangolin was indeed the intermediate between the bat and the human, but again, uh, the word is, uh, the final word is not out. So we will assume that uh, for now that the pangolin was uh, the intermediate host of the coronavirus from which another mutation or a set of mutations took place and it crossed over and infected the humans. So this is how it happens. Uh, the ancestor is the bat coronavirus. There was an intermediate host, which is the pangolin, which also uh, again accidentally discovered Harvard's coronavirus and that coronavirus gave rise to uh, the human coronavirus after some more mutations. Uh, accumulated in the in the genome in the RNA of the um, uh, of the pangolin coronavirus. So this is this is the sequence of events that uh, took place, and this is usually what happens when uh, we as, uh, as as a species, humans as a species, get infected. We usually can trace back uh, the viruses or the pathogens to some other animal. Most of the time, or very often, to the bat. Uh, all right. So this is this is what it is, and uh, if we uh, if I may make one or two other uh, general comments about uh, viruses and about this particular virus uh, before I move on to the actual evolution, the actual observation that we had, and then talk about the evolution of the virus. The one uh, statement that I will make is that viruses a virus is usually a termed as a pathogen, right? It causes disease in the humans. It often kills the humans as well, and therefore. Um, viruses are dreaded. Um, this particular virus, the SARS coronavirus 2, I've said this and I've written this, is a very kind virus. Has anybody heard about a kind virus? People have heard about kind human beings, right? Uh, kind virus. And why do I say that? And uh, the reason why I say that is, the, is as follows. That this is not the first 
human coronavirus or coronavirus that's known to infect humans. There have been other coronaviruses. Uh, three of the coronaviruses are quite benign. They don't cause any disease in the human. But two coronaviruses that are known that, that uh, you know, resulted in outbreaks, uh, disease outbreak, infection outbreaks. Um, the first one was again in Wuhan, can be traced back to Wuhan. That was in 2003. That uh, uh, coronavirus was uh, called SARS-CoV, um, but now we should probably call it as SARS-CoV-1 because at that time nobody imagined that there would be yet another outbreak and that would become a pandemic, another similar virus. That particular virus, of the 100 people that it infected, on an average it killed about 11 people. So uh, the, in, the rate of killing of that particular virus was 11 out of every 100 persons that it infected and it infects because it needs the host cells otherwise it's not it's going to become extinct so 11 out of 11 percent is the killing rate that that particular was an outbreak it was contained in wuhan it didn't spread very much and then it didn't even become an epidemic and it died the second outbreak again that was an outbreak did not become an epidemic and of course did not become a pandemic uh, was in the Middle East, and that is called the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus, MERS coronavirus. That coronavirus was uh, dangerous. Of the 100 people that it infected, it killed on an average 34 people. And why do I call SARS-CoV-2 as uh, kind? Primarily because the overall average, there are differences in different geographies that we are noticing. Overall, on an average, it's killing about 3 per 100. So 11 out of 100, 34 out of 100 to 3 out of 100. And that's the reason why I'm saying that this virus is very kind in the sense that it infects but does not kill. And that's a great property to have. It infects but does not kill. If uh, all of the people who were infected were killed or many of the people who were infected were killed, then life would be, be very, very more uh, difficult for all of us. As it is with the uh, spread of the infection, life has become difficult. We are very scared of being infected. But if, it, if the killing uh, power was more, then it would have become much more uh, dreadful and uh, we, our life would have become much more difficult. All right, so uh, what was the observation that we made and uh, what was the, uh, why did we get interested in the evolution? So it, uh, the uh, outbreak started in Wuhan in China and its outbreak started from a seafood market that was also selling other kinds of mammals um, for, for um, humans to eat. And uh, a person who was handling those uh, animals became infected or showed symptoms and uh, then the virus was isolated, the virus was sequenced, and we knew that that was the first case of the human coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2. The individual who was first infected and showed symptoms did not actually die, is still living, so that's a good thing. But um, more, more and more people became infected, the outbreak became an epidemic, and today we know it's a pandemic. As the outbreak spread, the virus also evolves, right? As the virus uh, goes through a passage of time, uh, through generations, just to get an analogy to our, uh, you know, humans or other animals, as it moves over through generations, these viruses evolve. By that, what I mean is that the RNA of the viruses starts accumulating mutations. Usually, the viral rate of accumulation of viral mutations or mutations in viruses is very fast. The reason being that once the virus replicates, then errors come in. It's like copying. So once you copy a page of a book, you introduce some errors, but then you read what you, what you have written. And uh, once you read that over again, after having uh, copied that, then you see that you have made some mistakes and you can correct those mistakes. Once you correct those mistakes, then ultimately what you have copied will contain no or very few mistakes. So the rate of mistakes is small once you are able to proofread what you have copied. Uh, most viruses do not have this proofreading ability after their uh, RNA is copied. This particular virus, SARS-CoV-2, has the proofreading ability and therefore after it replicates, it, it just makes a, a reading of the uh, copied uh, sequence, copied RNA sequence, and then it is able to correct those. Again, these are molecular biology details that I do not want to go into. It uh, corrects those and therefore the mutation rate, the rate of change, 
uh, the rate of errors um, is uh, pretty small in this particular coronavirus. Yet it evolves. It uh, does accumulate mutations, it evolves and so on. So over a period of time, uh, and, and the period of time is short because the generation time is very fast. These viruses are replicating within an individual, between individuals and so on and so forth. So it's um, uh, evolving very fast. Uh, what, during this process of evolution, even if the mutation rate is small, because of the rate at which it's evolving, uh, it accumulates mutations and like the different branches of a tree, it grows into different branches. Each branch is slightly different from the other branch in this particular, I'm giving you an analogy. In this particular case, each branch has a certain number of, certain set of mutations, which the other branch uh, may or may not have but the other branch also has some other specific kinds of mutations. So this is what happens. Different branches of the tree show certain differences. And this, uh, as the virus evolved, this virus from the base, from the root, uh, grew into 11 different kinds of uh, 10 different group, 10 different branches. And each different branch was called a subtype of the virus. Each subtype had its characteristic set of mutations. So today we know that there are 11 different subtypes of this virus even uh, considering the original ancestral virus. And so the original ancestral virus was denoted by the letter O, don't ask me why, was denoted by the letter O by the group of biologists who maintain databases, etc. They named this as O and the different branches are given names and these names are very funny names, A1, A2, A2, A, B1, B2, B, B, B3, etc. So these, these are the kinds of um, names that are given to these different branches. All right, so these are different subtypes. They spread to parts of the world and then they uh, expand their population size. They expand this total number of that kind of viruses. So this is how uh, the spread of viruses takes place. So normally if you if there are multiple subtypes of the virus you go to any place where it has spread you would find maybe not all but certainly uh, some number of subtypes you would find that they are proliferating in that particular region you go to another region there will be commonalities of some sub, some subtypes but there will be probably some other subtypes also that are proliferating in that particular region so this is this is what we would normally expect as viruses spread this is what happens in an outbreak uh, in the, during the outbreak, several branches develop, and as the branches spread, spread it becomes an epidemic. This is, these are the kinds of features that we observe in an epidemic. Now, when we looked at, fortunately, the um, international community maintains an influenza sequence database. This virus is related to the influenza virus. As you can see that the symptoms are also very similar. You get fever, you start coughing, and so on and so forth. The international community maintains an international uh, uh, sequence database of um, influenza-like viruses. So when we looked at that particular sequence database, and they also tell you from which particular region that particular virus came, and so on and so forth. So you have uh, geography, you have clinical data, you have the sequence data. And we, we were just looking at that particular uh, database out of curiosity. And after, so the, the, the virus evolved, uh, the, the virus was reported on 24th of December. By about March, it had spread to most places in the world. And uh, as it spread, what we were seeing is something very, very fun. There were 11 different subtypes that we already knew are available, including the ancestral. One would expect the ancestral subtype to first spread and then the uh, other subtypes, but anyway, we would expect a diversity of subtypes in various geographical regions. That was not to be. What we noted was one particular subtype was gaining ground and outcompeting all of the other subtypes. And this particular subtype that was outcompeting all of the subtypes was called A2A, was denoted um, with, uh, with, the, with the nomenclature capital A. Numeric 2, little a. So A2A is the subtype of the SARS-CoV-2 that was outcompeting everybody and spreading its wings uh, very much. Now, um, we uh, felt that, is it possible that this particular virus was given a handicap? And in this particular case, handicap would mean that they, a bunch of people carried this particular virus to another geographical region while the other um, subtypes of the virus were left behind. 
So this would give provide a handicap to, to this particular virus because they are the only one who are going and uh, sort of seeding another new geographical region where the virus did not exist. In which case, this is the only subtype that will actually spread because the other subtypes are left behind and they have no opportunity to move to that particular geographical region and spread. So we looked at the data very carefully and such a handicap was not there. So it's not because A to A reached a geographical region before the other uh, subtypes and that's the reason why the A to A was spreading that was not found that we analyzed the data very, very carefully. And what we found was that the A to A, in addition to its being the dominant subtype, it became extremely dominant in Europe and North America, but it was not so dominant in East Asia, comprising China, South Asia, uh, South, Southeast Asia, etc. This particular region, India, China, um, Thailand, Myanmar, uh, Philippines, Singapore, that this, this region, uh, it was dominant, it was becoming dominant, but still there were other subtypes that were also proliferating and it was not able to as efficiently outcompete all of the other viruses. But in Europe and North America, lo and behold, that was the only virus that was spreading. So that was a very strange thing. We had not encountered these kinds of situations earlier with spread of other kinds of viruses, inclu including the influenza virus. So we said that uh, let's look at this particular virus. This virus must, must have some ability to infect humans more efficiently. And that ability must be in its genome. So we said that we are going to look at it. We are not virologists, but we want to look at RNA sequences and uh, the, the data were already available. By the time we started becoming interested, it was known that these spikes that you see in the, on the surface of the corona, these are proteins, uh, in order to gain, and a lot of biology was already known, in order to gain entry into a human cell, and it actually enters a human lung cell, uh, the lung cell of a specific kind called type 2 pneumocyte, don't worry about the nomenclature, it enters a specific kind of lung cell. Uh, so this particular coronavirus first goes in, so the entry into the host cell, into the human lung cell, takes place in two stages. One is the virus, first of all, goes and anchors itself to the surface of the lung cell. Then what, it, what happens is that the lung cell also has a membrane, and it then breaks open the membrane and enters the cell, and then it uses the host cell machinery in order to replicate itself. This particular virus, again, for those of you who are interested in molecular biology and medicine, this particular coronavirus is a positive stranded coronavirus, which means that it's almost like the cDNA. It starts immediately replicating, so it's positively stranded. Again, that's as an aside, a technical aside, not, not the main story. So there are two parts to it. One is it's anchoring. It's landing on the host cell and anchoring itself to the host cell, then trying open the um, surface of the host cell and entering into the host cell for it to thrive. So the, there are two steps. What was known is that this particular spike, spike protein is the protein that is the, is the molecule, uh, is the protein that goes and anchors itself or helps anchoring itself to the human host cell. What does it anchor to and why is it, why does it anchor to this specific kind of lung, lung cell called type 2 pneumocyte? Type 2 pneumocytes um, on, the, on the surface of the cell, profusely express a protein called angiotensin converting enzyme 2, ACE2. The spike protein goes and anchors itself to the angiotensin converting enzyme 2. And so that's the anchor. And then once it anchors, it does a little bit of acrobatics and then enters the host cell. And the acrobatics are also very important. And I'll come to, I'll end my talk with the acrobatics later. So now I'm going to talk about the first phase where the spike protein goes and anchors itself to the ACE2 uh, to, to the, um, uh, ACE2 protein, ACE2 protein on the lung cell pneumocyte. Okay, again, as a little bit of a side for those of you who are interested in clinical parts of this, uh, you may have read in the newspapers that individuals who are on antihypertensives who are hypertensive and take drugs to reduce, keep their hypertension under check, one of the popular drugs is called an angiotensin inhibitor. So angiotensin inhibitors are popular um, antihypertensives. And angiotensin inhibitor 
actually what it does is it helps overexpress the ACE2 on the surface of the uh, type 2 pneumocytes. Again, I'm not going to go get into the biology of it, how it does. So angiotensin inhibitor, uh, inhibitors that are used in hypertension actually promote the uh, expression of ACE2 on the surface of the lung cell. And if there is more protein on the surface of the lung cell, more of the viruses can anchor onto the lung cell. So you may have heard this, that um, people who are on uh, angiotensin, uh, angiotensin inhibitors are more susceptible to the virus. And this is the reason why they're more susceptible to the virus. What we said is that, what is it? Is it possible that the A2A, the virus that is the viral subtype that's outcompeting all other viruses, is it possible that this virus is able to anchor on better to the human uh, lung cell? Um, so we looked at the sequence and we looked at the changes in the sequence. We did bioinformatic analysis to find out what these changes, how would it change the shape of the spike protein, etc., or other proteins. And again, to cut a long story short, <clears throat> we concluded that one particular mutation that leads to an amino acid change, and this is at the amino acid position 614 of the um, viral uh, protein. Uh, this has an um, uh, aspartic acid, D. Uh, so the mutation is called D614G. D is a single letter word that denotes aspartic acid or aspartate. And G is a single letter amino acid code for glycine. So aspartic, aspartic acid changes to glycine at position 614. And the A, A2A, while the wild type, the other subtypes have D, which is aspartic acid, this particular subtype, the A2A, has the G um, amino acid. And we um, thought that maybe this glycine, aspartic acid to glycine change, provides the ability to the uh, human coronavirus, the A2A coronavirus, to anchor on to the human lung cell much better, much more efficiently. So we did other kinds of analysis. There were people who were also doing experimentation with viruses. Uh, we are not allowed to do experimentation with this particular virus because we don't have, in our institute, we do not have the appropriate containment facility. So we were unable to do any experimentation, but we were in touch with various groups in the world who are doing these kinds of experiments. And we were quickly getting data as to what happens when the aspartic acid changes to glycine. And lo and behold, there were people who uh, around the world who independently came to the same conclusion that this D614G mutation enables the virus to anchor on to the host cell, to the human lung cell more efficiently. So this was one piece of the puzzle that we had solved, which is that the A2A virus is able to anchor to the human coronavirus, to the human lung cell much more efficiently. And if, it, uh, if it's able to anchor much more efficiently to the human lung cell, its probability of being able to infect the lung cell also enhances. And maybe that's the reason why it's out competing the out other viruses and uh, is able to spread through, through the world. So there were other people who were doing petri dish experiments, cell biology experiment, and they actually showed that the infectivity increases. And so what we proposed is the model came, uh, was uh, validated by people who were able to experiment with this virus. So it was very clear to us that this is one reason why the A2A had spread so well in throughout the world. I also told you in the beginning that it spread much more efficiently, it became the really, really the only dominant uh, viral subtype in Europe and North America. But it wasn't uh, the dominant subtype or wasn't the only dominant subtype in East Asia, including South and Southeast Asia. Uh, so we thought that why is it happening in this way? Uh, and we proposed a hypothesis because I do human genetics. And so I'm, I um, look at the human genome from a different perspective, even with respect to infectious diseases. So I said that maybe uh, ethnically, ancestrally, people in Europe and North America have evolved separately along a separate lineage compared to people in Southeast Asia. Europe and Mongoloid, I, I don't like to typify humans, but anyway, uh, people in uh, Europe and North America are called Caucasoids, and people in South Asia, East Asia, these are the places where 
they would be non caucasoids and they would be called mongoloids or australoids and so on and so forth so that's that's that, that's just putting people in boxes which is not something that i really like to do but just for the sake of exposition i'm using that terminology so we said that they have different uh, evolutionary perspective humans occupying these different uh, continents or different geographical areas have a different uh, ancestry and therefore is it possible and because of a different ancestry their genomes are also quite different um, and is it possible that the host genome has something to do with uh, the the spread so the, the the ability of the virus to spread much more much better in europe and now north america than in east asia so we started again we ourselves have a large database of human genomes and there are also global based databases of human genomes called thousand genomes database and genome asia database etc etc so we started uh, looking at these databases and looking at what may be uh, the important proteins changes in the genes of which might give this ability so we came out with some candidate proteins one candidate protein is obvious which is ace2 ace2 is an ob obvious candidate protein because that's where the spike protein of the virus anchors so uh, we said that are there other can candidate proteins now i have to go I'll be a little technical and tell you uh, the second part of my story which is the first part was that uh, one of the points that i made was that the virus uh, enters in two stages anchors and then pries open the cell membrane and gets into the cell i told you about the first part which is which enables the virus to spread anchor and spread so well does it also enter the host cell well if it's not unable to enter the host cell well then it cannot spread because the only way for the virus to spread is from person to person and uh, then we looked at the biology of prying open uh, or splitting uh, the uh, cell membrane and getting into it if you look at the spike protein the spike protein has two parts two domains one's called the s1 domain and the other is called the s2 domain and between these two domains there has to be a cleavage there is a cleavage side it needs to cleave that side it needs to cut that break make it into two pieces s1 and s2 as separate um, sub proteins and then that enables the virus to enter the host cell so there is a cleavage side this cleavage side Uh, the actual cleaving the actual cutting of that particular site is also done by a protein and that protein i'm not going to expand the name that protein is called that's a human protein that's called tempres2 it's uh, uh, expressed by the human so the human protein actually helps cleave that particular site between s1 and s2 proteins so we said tempres2 may be another uh, candidate gene Uh, a pro the corresponding gene that produces tempres2 protein may be another candidate where possibly there are differences in the sequence among people who live in europe and north america versus people who live live in east asia so tempres2 became our uh, other possible uh, you know other other possible uh, gene and again i'm sorry that i have to get a little bit technical we uh, there are of course many variants in these genes we looked at ace2 and we found that there were no variants of any significance that showed frequency differences between europe north america versus east asia so we actually ruled out the possibility that genetic very human genetic variation in ace2 gene uh, was creating this uh, difference between the, um, the efficiency uh, in in the virus to spread we focused on tempres2 tempres2 had a large number of variations between europe and Uh, Europe, North America versus East Asia, and we said uh, we have to somehow focus on a subset of these large number of variations that we see. And what we decided is that we will look at what are called expression quantitative trait loci. Now this becomes a little technical. These are called eQTLs. So these are genetic variants that actually impact on the expression of the corresponding gene. so we looked at uh, we asked ourselves what are the eqtls what are those genetic variants that actually um, uh, impact on the expression of tempres2 and we found one and interestingly enough that particular eqtl also controlled the expression of another adjacent gene which is called mx1 so we found a cute eqtl we found a genetic variant that controlled the expression of sim simultaneous expression of two genes once the tempres2 and the other is called the mx1 mx1 wasn't even in the horizon for us we we were not considering the mx1 protein at all uh, but 
this uh, enabled us to identify this particular gene that was this particular gene variant that was controlling both proteins. And so what we looked at was what does the MX1 gene do? So MX1 gene without getting into the uh, too getting without elaborating too much, um, essentially what it does is that it recruits another, uh, it recruits what are called neutrophils, and these neutrophils carry a specific kind of protein called elastase, and the elastase is also like a pair of scissors, like Tempress one, elastase is also like a pair of scissors that cuts. What is this gene variant? The gene variant is also very interesting. The gene variant is, in the normal type, there is a nucleotide C, in the variant type, that particular nucleotide is deleted. So it's a deletion polymorphism, as we call it. So it's a deletion polymorphism. It's a deletion C polymorphism. This deletion, deletion C polymorphism essentially does nothing to Tempress 1. But it helps the MX1 recruit a large number of neutrophils to the site of the type 2 pneumocyte. And these neutrophils then express elastase. So now once the neutrophils are recruited, Two things happen. The Tempress one acts as one pair of scissors. The elastase, which is carried by the neutrophils, uh, expresses uh, acts as another pair of scissors. Another pair of scissors. So now you have two pairs of scissors that are only possessed by the A2A subtype, because the A2A subtype is the, not possessed by the A2A subtype. The A2A subtype is anchored. The European humans and the um, East Asian humans. In the East Asian, in the European humans, you have two pairs of scissors, and in the East Asian humans, you have only one pair of scissors. So the not only is it anchoring better in the Europeans and East Asians, it's able to cleave better, and therefore larger number of viruses are entering the host cells, and therefore it's spreading faster because. The more uh, hosts, the more host cells it's able to enter, uh, it's going to, the individual is going to sneeze, the individual is going to talk, and therefore the individual is going to spread the viruses very well. So we, uh, what, what we started as an observation, as a curious observation, we eventually got to a biological explanation. The curious observation was, first of all, the spread, and second of all, um, the differential spread between Europe, North America versus East Asia, uh, we knew that there are two phases. Uh, we first showed that in the first phase, which uh, pertains to the anchoring, the A2A subtype is able to anchor much better uh, to those individuals, uh, to, to human individuals, and therefore um, it, it's uh, probably that's one reason why it's able to spread better. And then the second thing that the second piece of the puzzle came: why is there a differential um, rate of spread in Europe, North America versus East Asia? And then we implicated humans, and we said that individuals who in Europe and North America have this Del C variant, the deletion C variant, which provides two pairs of scissors, two cleavage sites, one Tempest 2 and the other um, elastase, which is possessed in much smaller frequency among humans. The Del C variant, the deletion variant, occurs in a much smaller frequency among humans who, uh, whose ancestries are, um, you know, um, different from the ancestries of people of Europe and North America. And so these individuals have only one pair of scissors. The, the virus is not able to enter so well into the host cell. And therefore, even though it's able to anchor better, it's not able to sp uh, spread as rapidly as it is able to spread in um, Europe and North America. So this, uh, uh, this is the curiosity that we started with. And this is the conclusion that we have, uh, um, you know, obtained, the biological insight that we have obtained as to how the um, A2A virus subtype is um, entering and uh, spreading itself uh, so well in uh, different parts of, uh, of the world. And, but also at the same time, there is a differential, um, differential spread. Uh, the last uh, two minutes, I will tell you about how do we, there's a lot of talk about uh, people are asking, when is this going to end? When is this pandemic going to end? So you can ask that question, but you need to be able to have a quantitative measure of uh, tracking the spread. Is there a quantitative measure of track? How do we actually track the spread of this particular virus? So of, or for that matter, any virus, any, any viral outbreak as it spreads, how do we track whether uh, time has come that it, we can be assured that the virus is going to become extinct, uh, the pandemic is going to die, and so on. So one of the most popular there are many, 
and I'm not going to, uh, this is not a course in epidemiology, I'm not going to give you all of the various measures, but the first thing that I will say is that, uh, you know, this, this question has to be answered with objectivity in mind. You can ask, when is it going to end? How do I answer that question? I have to have an objective quantitative measure. So quantification is very important. We have to have a quantitative measure based on which you can say that the virus is going to come down or um, is coming down and is expected to die within this period of time and so on. So let me first, uh, uh, before I actually give you the measure, let me motivate this. The motivation is that if an infected individual is unable to find any infected individual, uh, any uninfected individual to infect, then the virus cannot spread itself because there is no other uninfected individual. Now, an individual, when an individual gets infected with the virus, the individual gains immunity. So in a short period of time, the same virus cannot infect that individual. So if most of us have gained immunity and if there is only one person in the community who is infected, that individual cannot find an uninfected individual to infect. So what's going to happen? That individual, if the individual dies, then the virus dies with that individual. If the individual recovers, then also the virus dies with that individual. So this is how uh, you know viruses become extinct. Now, if one individual is able to find only one other individual to infect, then the, the spread of the virus will be like horizontal to the x-axis, like it will become a plateau. That means one, uh, one individual is infecting one individual, the one individual, the original individual either dies or recovers, the next individual uh, either dies or recovers, but before death or recovery is infecting one other individual. So at any point of time, you would have exactly the same number of individuals in the population, and therefore the virus is the, the spread of the virus has become a plateau. But if an individual, if an infected individual is able to find, let's say, three uninfected individuals and is able to infect three of them, then of course you know what's going to happen. Then the number of then the virus is going to spread like wildfire because one individual is now able to infect more than one individual. So this is exactly what we track. Um, how do we know uh, that there are more individuals to infect, etc.? So there is a quantitative measure which is called R0. R0 has three components, and again, I, mean, I don't want to leave a little bit of time for you to ask me questions. R0 has three components, two of which are kind of fixed, they're biological, one of which has to do with gain of immunity and so on and so forth. How many other people can it infect? So that particular uh, parameter, that particular component of R0 can be estimated from the population depending on how many infected are there, how many are showing symptoms, and so on and so forth. Uh, or uh, of the total number of people, how many are infected, etc. That becomes a part of a component that can be estimated based on which R0 can be estimated. So the upshot of all of this is that R0 is an objective measure that can be estimated based on data collected and once we collect that data, we can see whether R0 is greater than 1, equal to 1, or less than 1. When it is greater than 1, the, the virus is still spreading in the community. When it is equal to 1, the virus has become, the spread of the virus has become a plateau. When it is less than 1, the spread of the virus is coming down. And therefore, depending on the, the, the slope of that line, we can predict when the virus is actually going to become extinct. So that's the way by which we track the spread of viruses and or, or, or any any infection for that matter. And uh, this this is this is what is being done right now for India. I understand. I'm again not collecting primary data. I understand that R naught is between two and three, depending on which places you go. In some places, I'm told that it's over four, uh, which essentially means that the virus is still spreading. Uh, I don't hold me to those numbers. Those numbers are coming from uh, you know, various uh, blog sites or newspaper reports, etc. I don't have access to uh, that, those kinds of data, the epidemiological data. But anyway, the upshot of all of this is that from the estimates that have been obtained from India, the R0 value is still greater than 1, which essentially means that we still have to be very careful and we have to, um, uh, you know, we have to be... Uh, we have to take into cognizance the fact that the virus is still spreading in the community, whether we like it or not. Every day, we have between 20 and 25,000 more individuals infected with the virus, as you can see. Every day, we have about 500 new deaths that, that you can see.
So uh, this this is uh, what it is. So I've talked to you about the characteristics of a virus, about the characteristics of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. I've told you that the SARS-CoV-2 virus is a kind virus. I've then told you about what brought me into this kind of thing, even though I'm not a this kind of research, even though I'm not a virologist. It was just a simple observation and some uh, uh, peculiarities of the viral spread. Uh, that brought me into uh, evoke my interest into this area, and uh, finally we've been able to. Uh, I think we've been able to. We don't claim that that's the only factor, but at least one of the major factors of the um, anchoring of this one particular type of virus and of its ability to gain uh, entry because the hosts have um, you know double scissors compared to a single scissors. In some regions they have double scissors. And uh, other regions, they have a single scissors, and I uh, finally told you that uh, right now, how to track uh, the spread of a virus and the fact that in India right now, uh, we still haven't been able to get our dot to uh, below one, which means that we still have to be very cautious uh, and wear a mask and uh, use hand sanitizers, uh, you know, wash our hands with soap, etc., remove clothes uh, once we get in. Although now it's being told that. Uh, from the surfaces, uh, the uh, chance of the virus being transmitted is low, but still, it's uh, better to be safe and careful uh, and protect ourselves than um, to, be, to be unsafe and uh, don't care about the virus. The virus is kind, but it, it spreads quite quite often and we can't, we can't predict uh, in whom it's going to be kind and in whom it's going to be unkind, so we have to be prepared for the fact that the virus may be unkind to me and therefore I must take the appropriate precaution to uh, prevent infection in me. I thank you very much for uh, your attention and for um, asking me to give this talk. I'm absolutely delighted that many of the senior colleagues are here and uh, I hope that my, my presentation was uh, clear enough. I deliberately uh, did not have any slides, but I hope that I've been able to convey to you what I wanted to convey about this virus, etc. Uh, Professor Satyamurthy is uh, showing an issue of resonance where uh, you know there are multiple articles about uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, and also about COVID-19, which is which is a disease. And there, in that particular issue, I've written a couple of articles about what I told you at the end. Um, which has to do with the epidemiology, the fact that you need quantitative measures to track and so on and so forth. So uh, if you're interested, please read Resonance. Resonance is uh, a journal of science education that's uh, published by the Indian Academy of Sciences. Professor Satyamurthy, uh, who held aloft that particular issue, is the uh, chief editor of, the, uh, of that particular science education journal. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Pathura. Thank you for the wonderful lecture. And uh, I also thanks Professor uh, Shatyamurti with always being with us. And definitely we will collect the uh, resonance uh, journal for, from our JBNSTS also so that our scholars and students can get it. Uh, Professor Parthapati Majumdar, as, uh, uh, I thank him for his eloquent lecture. Now, I think the scholars may ask some questions. Obhijit, will you please yeah. handle it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the session is now open for the, some questions. Already, I can see that uh, somebody is asking that, um, uh, that COVID-19 is not as well as SARS or MARS, but is more infectious. So, um, how do you uh, answer this question? Uh, so what's the question? That's an obvious question. question. Is is the COVID-19 COVID is more infectious, but not that fatal like uh, SARS or MARS. That's the question. So uh, again, the point is, I first of all, a correction. COVID-19 is not the virus. COVID-19 is a coronavirus disease. Uh, the virus is SARS-CoV-2. Um, so the SARS-CoV-2, like I said, it's more kind, it kills less people than um, SARS or SARS-CoV-1 or MERS, uh, that's a fact, that's an observation. We still do not know uh, why SARS-CoV-2 is more kind compared to MERS, but uh, comparisons have shown certain kinds of mutations in MERS, which are not present in SARS-CoV-2, and the uh, assumption 
is that uh, those particular mutations render the virulence ability to be higher in MERS, uh, in MERS than, uh, than in SARS-CoV-2. Right now, the entire research community is so bogged down with understanding SARS-CoV-2 that uh, people haven't even asked really previously, can we identify those uh, mutations in MERS, uh, in MERS versus, uh, versus SARS-CoV-2 that enables MERS to kill more people compared to SARS-CoV-2? That research will happen um, after you know we gain a little bit more understanding of SARS-CoV-2 about its spread and uh, virulence. Uh, incidentally, the virulence uh, among the subtypes, I talked to, to you about 11 different subtypes. As far as we can tell, the virulence of the different subtypes are by and large the same. All subtypes are equally kind. Okay, thank you. So, any other questions from the participants? Ben? Yeah. Sir? Is there a uh, can coronavirus affect domestic animals like cows? Uh, we've heard some uh, reports that it crosses uh, species boundaries uh, to other mammals. Uh, and I've read that dogs and cats being infected by coronavirus. But again, uh, the word is not, uh, the jury is still out. I mean, we still don't know whether it's uh, completely true or not. Uh, because, um, yeah, we st still don't know. But chances are that it uh, infects uh, other mammals as well. Okay. Uh, any further questions? I will ask a question. Opposite. I, I would like to ask yeah, a question. Ahead. Uh, yes, sir, yes. I uh, got into a, a paper which indicated that A plus blood group has some added uh, inclination for the infection of uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, is there any uh, gene, gene link or anything? Maybe it, there may be some reason for it. So, uh, this is very interesting that uh, this 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 particular finding has uh, been thrown out the window. The reason being, when they increase the sample size, the association does not hold up. So there is a subsequent paper, uh, subsequent to the paper that you are uh, mentioning about uh, the blood group association, uh, when they increase the sam sample size, I think sample size was increased about 5 or 5.5 fold, and the association was not there anymore. So we still don't know whether that was a true association or a false oh. positive association. Thank you for I believe that. it was false positive. So it's a great relief, yeah. I think. I, I myself yes. would like to raise one question. That's, you have said that R0 value is yes, still a little high. On for sure. So, yeah, so where sh should the R0 value will remain when we will feel uh, So again, I mean, this is this is a debated issue. This is a debated issue, but uh, one can do some backup beyond the calculations. Uh, not very difficult at all by that. What I mean by that is that uh, it's easy calculations. I said that there are three components to R1. I didn't actually elaborate on the three components. One of the components is estimable right. from data that we collect. The other two components are not estimable because that's a biological property. It's with respect to those biological properties that there is a lot of uh, you know speculation and there is a lot of uh, argumentation. Uh, with respect to what can be estimated, there is not very much of argumentation. Now, uh, the uh, point is that, like I said, that this is one individual infecting more than one individual or not. So the virus will not find uh, any individuals to infect if most other individuals in the population uh, have gained immunity. Uh, what I said most other populations, so I need to quantify that. So the uh, way that we can prove using certain assumptions and formulas is that if it's 50%, we are reasonably safe. It's probably parallel to the x-axis. If it is 67%, it's uh, taking a dip uh, towards the x-axis, which means that the virus will soon uh, become extinct. 67% of the population needs to become immune when we can be absolutely certain that the virus is going to die a natural death. Okay. Thank you Excuse so much. Uh, it it, it, it feels that uh, we need, still need to wait time, for a long, long time. time. Uh, okay. Obviously, uh, a question. Uh, there is a person called Vigneshwar who asked this question, and it's actually uh, it quite a whole lot of people. Uh, uh, prof, uh, as you said, the virulence of this thing is very limited. The fatality rate is, is uh, quite low. 
uh, but the infection is high, uh, and so people are taking this as an uh, you know as a license to go out and alarm. What is your opinion? Should we be alarmed? How seriously should we take? Should we take this? Because not uh, most people are saying that it's fatality rate is not high, so not, not we take it too seriously. Could you answer that, please? So your uh, voice was breaking, uh, Shubankar. I wasn't able to hear your question so well. So let me uh, let me repeat your question and see if I've understood you right. Uh, the fact that this virus is kind it spreads well but does not kill many people are taking, um, assuming that you know nothing is going to happen to me and therefore they are giving up on various precautionary measures. Uh, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Is that what you're asking? Yes, uh, because the fatality rate is not high, people think that it is safer to go out and it, it's not killing me that actually. So, what is high? how right or wrong is this? Uh, uh, did uh, anybody uh, understand the question that Shubhankar is asking? No, actually, voice is not uh, coming clear. I will put the chat. Yeah, Maybe we we'll do internet connections. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, ask a question in the chat box. So that we, yeah, you can type it. So, in the meantime, is there any, is there any other question in the chat uh, box? I well? have a Sir. question. Hmm. Sir, I have a question. Yes. Okay. Oh, no, no. First, oh, no, no. Oh, you, you ask it? your question and then I will take from it. Sir, right. yes, sir. Uh, okay. Uh, how does sanitizer help us to kill the virus? You told about the soap and hand wash. What is about the sanitizer? Uh, it's, it's essentially essentially the same. It's the same same. Uh, it just gets rid of the lipid and uh, essentially you know, the naked exposes the naked RNA, which does not which is unstable. Okay. So can I ask? Okay. You? Yeah. Show me. Nick. Uh, yes, sir. so I recently read an article like uh, that SARS-CoV-2 can spread by water as well as air, like it's waterborne as well as airborne. So how much is this true? Uh, waterborne, I don't know. Right now there is a big debate that's going on because uh, WHO only said that it goes through droplets and does not go through, go through aerosols. Aerosols are much smaller than droplets. Uh, they're all, we're all in the micron uh, domain so uh, aerosols are much smaller than I don't remember the you know, the ranges but droplets are much bigger in diameter compared to the aerosols and WHO said that uh, it doesn't spread through aerosols day before yesterday 230 odd scientists have signed a petition saying that they have reason to believe that or they have proof uh, that it goes through aerosols as well uh, waterborne I do not know but uh, certainly there is uh, room to believe that it goes through aerosols uh, and or transmits through aerosols. So right now, WHO is examining that data, and uh, WHO may, might actually announce that it also is airborne. If it goes through aerosols, then it becomes airborne. Droplet is also airborne, but doesn't travel too much. But aerosols can travel quite a bit, and then it becomes even more difficult for us because if it travels airborne, it's going to be much more difficult for us to contain these simple masks that we are using to prevent droplets may not actually prevent aerosol. So we life becomes much more difficult for us. Okay, thank you. Just one comment. No, Shubankar's question? Yeah. No, no, wait, wait, wait. Shubankar's question was on the chat box. Can somebody see and tell me? Or I can't see, or can I see the, where is, where is the chat box? I don't see the chat box. Uh, since the fatality rate is low, many people are thinking it's okay to step out since it's not dangerous, what is your opinion? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. So since the fatality, so fatality rate being low is good, uh, but at the same time, you know, right now there is a mask fatigue. People are fatigued of wearing a mask. It's not simple to wear a mask and go out and do your daily chores, I mean, especially in the heat and humidity. So people are taking it easy, but uh, again, the point is that uh, those of us who are over the hill in terms of age. We need to be extra cautious because we are more vulnerable. Uh, many of us are on antihypertensives and so on. So we are more vulnerable. We certainly should not take life easy. But, uh, or at least this pandemic so um, easy. But people who are young, most most of them will actually recover without any symptoms. This is not to say that I'm 
promoting that masks not be used and washing not be used that's not what i'm promoting but all that i'm saying is that you know there has there, there is a fatigue from wearing masks i see that uh, and people can't be blamed we have already been wearing masks for almost six, six months let's just be careful that's all we should uh, i can say but eventually uh, many many of us will actually become infected we may or may not know this uh, because much of it is asymptomatic so we don't need to be so scared and stigmatize people so much so fear and stigma are two major components of this particular pandemic we don't need to be so fearful we don't need to stigmatize but at the same time we need to be cautious and one of the things that we can do or some of the things that we can do is to wear a mask wearing a mask is uh, more like protecting other people than yourself essentially because you are talking so you are protecting other people so it's your duty to protect other people and uh, so wear a mask use uh, hand sanitizers have become cheap now they were expensive or just use a regular soap and wash your hands multiple times a day uh, if uh, the water permits if you don't have water then use hand sanitizer that's all i could say i, th I think we need to take uh, precaution it is not a bad idea to take precaution but it's not worthwhile just to uh, be so scared you see influenza also is uh, is not a simple virus is also uh, a killer virus but are we afraid of uh, influenza so much probably not this virus has spread like wildfire uh, and that's one reason why yeah okay excuse me for so, uh, some other questions yeah. yes sir yeah, i had so, one yeah, question carry on sir um uh, sir uh, uh, I recently I've been seeing that like uh, uh, with regard to new diseases and like uh, um, organisms whose genome has been recently sequenced. So uh, there is a part of the research that goes on uh, like in wet lab like, um, like hybridization and uh, PCR and all of that and there is another section of research that is like uh, fairly upcoming that takes computation of uh, little approaches to that like gene expression classification and uh, all of that clustering and all of that so like according to you uh, which of those has assumed more importance in the case of sars cov2 uh, the two serve two different purposes uh, the second one for example the bioinformatics computational uh, this this cannot prove mm -hmm. anything this essentially provides uh, hypothesis to be tested and uh, the the kind of things that you talked about in the first part which is PCR cell biology experiments petri dish those are able to prove uh, the hypothesis that uh, are propounded or, or, or generated by the computational approaches so I, I think both are important um, at this time because uh, fortunately because of the availability of a large number of RNA sequences in public yes, domain yes. databases yes. Uh, this has become very popular and a lot of hypotheses have been generated, some of which uh, have actually been tested and validated in the wet yes. lab, but both of these complement each other. So I, I think see. both are important. I see. Sir, and like uh, in your own work, like which of these two pathways do you uh, like uh, concentrate on? The second pathway, because as I said in the beginning, that I do not have the permission to uh, handle this virus in the lab. Uh, the, it needs some containment facilities, it needs strict uh, security, viral security and containment. We do not have that and therefore in the institute uh, and therefore uh, my part is only restricted to the second part which is computational and statistical. But we work with other um, you know, friends throughout the world who we generate hypotheses and request them to test these using cell biology and all of that and that's how we've gotten to uh, the second part of our biology, which had to deal with uh, this deletion C, uh, one particular nucleotide yeah. that uh, we've shown through. We haven't done the biological experiment, other people have done the wet lab experiments and have shown that. Yes, sir, I had just one last question. So, like, uh, since you, uh, your field of work is primarily towards computational biology, what, according to you, is like uh, the most important tool like going going into the next decade what is going to be the most important tool in computational biology today what does that mean 
like the most uh, important tool uh, or like something that uh, that you believe is like proving very useful uh, which are you are you a student in the college in are you a student no no i'm not college? i have a very i have a very uh, limited experience of these so like no no I, but I, what I do you do what what do you yeah. do yes i have just like passed class 12 this year fantastic learn mathematics very well i see just go and concentrate and learn mathematics everything will become very easy Okay. Computation will become easy. You will be able to learn. Uh, learning computer languages is uh, is e very easy, as a matter of fact. But what is important is for you to be able to develop your own algorithms for which mathematics is required. Of course. Just concentrate on mathematics, and everything else will come to your lap, and you will be able to uh, you know nurture those very easily. But if you don't learn mathematics at this stage. you are going to be a user of somebody else's algorithms and you will not be able to of course, create of course. of course yes thank you very much sir thank you very much sir i have a question sir i have a question abhi right. you have to monitor hello uh yes hello professor mr sir 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 who उटिंग in this situation so until many of us gain immunity that's what i believe uh and that many can be quantified uh, so i have used the number 67% uh but again it's not free of assumptions so if these assumptions are not met it may be larger or smaller but roughly many many of us have to gain immunity such that an infected person does not find a large number of people to infect so we have to wait that i can't of hand give you a number on time okay okay obijit obijit i think yeah, chat i'm chat or i'm going to take that questions from urunduti how does blood plasma of recovered covid 19 patient help in treatment of newly infected patients so very interesting question so the blood, when when infection takes place that's an antigen that gets into the body the body's immune system produces what are called antibodies so uh, an individual who has recovered from the infection uh, would have a lot of a uh, rich uh, amount of antibodies that are actually able to help the that has actually helped the individual recover that's the assumption so this individual's plasma will contain all of those antibodies which we can sequester which we can harvest and use on an individual who has been infected with the antigen but is not provide, able to um, you know produce those kinds of antibodies the good antibodies that are able to kill the virus so we inject these antibodies from the outside we don't inject the antibodies we use the plasma that's called plasma therapy and that essentially is uh, rich in these antibodies that are uh, able to kill the virus and that's the reason for this plasma therapy so now uh, in the in the same line srija is asking one question that in a newspaper she has read that asymptomatic people the antibody is most not viable for more than 2 to 3 months so how is immunity going to develop in those people as the number of asymptomatic are more so i uh, don't know again the jury is still out on this that uh, uh, how long does the immunity last we still don't know you see this 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 uh, whole uh, virus uh, or the history of this virus is only about 6 months and so uh, we need to learn much more so we still don't have an accurate estimate of how long the immunity will last whether uh, the, the immunity is going to wane or not and i don't also don't know whether that the period of immunity is related to the symptoms of the uh, disease after infection so it may or may not be actually related to the symptoms of the disease it may well be that people who are, do not show symptoms are able to produce the antibodies much more quickly before sufficient number of viruses are able to expand within the the viral population is able to expand within the uh, individual so we still don't know these uh, but maybe some things are known i'm not aware uh, 
uh, I'm not so sure that it is related to symptoms only. Okay. So uh, another interesting question from Orno Pramanik. This he said that this virus have proofreading activity. Yes. Is this property will be helping to stay more and more infectious? No, no, no. That has nothing to do with uh, being more infectious. Just that. Uh, the virus will evolve slower and therefore uh, lots of again i mean i have to get very technical because you can induce mutations in order to kill a virus yeah so there are uh, ways of therapy where they induce mutations there are vaccines that will promote mutations and that's how they kill the virus but again i mean the, the answer to this is that yes and no there are certain things that you can do uh, but uh, not exactly what she's uh, proposing okay and uh, Tushar Riddhi, I will take your question. Don't worry. Uh, before that, uh, Tushar is asking that whatever the side effects, he said that recovered patients are sometimes also sh showing different side effects. So, how to handle that? Uh, recovered pain? No, the side effects. Uh, side effects is not the right word. They also show other kinds of symptoms, uh, not just the symptoms of the pulmonary or the respiratory system. So the other, um, there are a few other symptoms. For example, you lose taste, you lose the sense of smell, and more important, those are okay. Well, not so okay, but anyway, can be lived with. But what you lose is, uh, you know, blood flow, and so many of these patients actually develop um, gangrene and other such things uh, in the arms or extremities, and they have to be amputed. And uh, um, how the blood flow is restricted because of this particular virus uh, i read somewhere but i'm not a clinician maybe our clinician colleagues will be able to friends uh, in the audience will be able to tell you more but yes i mean i really don't know how this virus also impact upon impacts upon the lymphatics and the blood flow i really don't know that okay uh Riti, would you would you would you like to carry your question with bonik um, yeah. Yes, sir. Sir, I am Sharanya Banik. Um, so, uh, sir, uh, sorry, sir, it's my sister's account. So, uh, sir, why is an intermediate host essential for the spread of COV2? Uh, can't it directly spread from the bat to the humans? Sure, sure it can. I mean, it's not, it's not uh, absolutely essential. Uh, but uh, mammal to mammal transmission is easier than non-mammal to mammal transmission, and that's why it was speculated. No, it's not always essential that you have to have an intermediate host, not at all. Okay. Thank you, uh, sir. There is a question from Omorto Mojumdar. He says that uh, uh, coronavirus and HIV genome are similar by comparing few genetic sequences. Is it true? If it is true, then what logical reasons can be explanation of it? Coronavirus and what? Uh, HIV genome. I don't know how similar they are. I honestly don't know. Compare, he said comparing some genetic sequences, they are similar. But how it's similar? Similar, of course, they will be, but how similar? What is I don't know. Uh, I, I honestly don't know. That, that, that's Mojimla, are you here? Yeah. Some, 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 yeah. some what's the sequence identity? What's the identity? Actually, there is a paper public is that uncanny similarity of unique inserts in the 2019 NCOP spike protein to, to HIV, GHP120, and GAG. Uh, don't know. Okay. Cannot answer. I don't want to make a, a you know, answer something wrong. So I don't know this. OK. So, uh, yeah, Urunavo, carry on. Sir, in almost all the European countries, COVID is at its end now, having infected approximately 0.5% of their population of the, of the same order. So, uh, but you said that uh, they need to infect about 67% uh, or something like that. So why do you think this is the case? And uh, uh, secondly, uh, why is this not happening in America and Brazil? They have uh, like their... Uh, uh, amount of uh, percentage of population which has been infected is far more than that in the European countries. 
Um, yes, I mean, the, the, the point is that uh, if you can keep people under so lockdown, uh, okay, so let's imagine the following. Let's imagine the following scenario that there are uh, three, house, three households in a particular community, only three households. One of those households, uh, a member gets infected. And as soon as a member gets infected, the government gets alerted. And the government says that they are going to lock all members of these three households completely separately, right? So what's going to happen in the first household? Most everybody or all of them will get infected and then they will not find another person to infect, right? Because the other household members are just completely locked in their household. They're not allowed to go out at all. So yes. after about 14, 21, 28 days, there will be no virus left in the first household. So what's going to happen? Now you open up, then what has happened? That in 28 days, the virus is gone or whatever. It may not be 28, maybe five times 28. Even so, the virus is gone, right? Yes. Uh, how many people did it infect? It, uh, let's assume that the three households are of the same size. Then it infected only 33% of the population of that community, which comprised three households. Germany has done this exactly the same way. The, uh, China has also done exactly the same way. They almost built an iron wall around Wuhan and stopped all flights. So essentially that became one single household. There were no people to left, uh, left to infect within that household. The virus vanished. And now you open up the iron curtain and it doesn't matter. So that's the, that's the concept. So um, the 67% I emphasized multiple times that it is based on certain assumptions. So when you lock up people like that, those assumptions are invalidated and therefore that amount, the number, uh, goes down. Um, I hope that I've been able to at least provide you with the concept uh, behind the answer. Yes, yeah? sir. So I have a supplemental question to that. Then uh, in the case of India, like the way we are locking down in India, what do you think, how much percentage of our population will it affect? Uh, no, you see, what happens is that uh, you lock down, and if there is some amount of leakage of this lockdown, uh, then it's not going to happen so well. So in India, there has been leakage. In most countries, there has been leakage. The other extreme is Sweden, right? Where they said that we won't do any lockdown. And look at what has happened to Sweden. They said that we are going to promote herd immunity. Very, I never use the word herd immunity. So community immunity very quickly by not locking down and see what's happened to Sweden. So again, I mean, there are different ways of uh, dealing with the, with the situation uh, with the viral infection. Different countries have adopted different kinds of scenarios. Uh, some of them are palatable scenarios. Some of them are not so palatable scenarios. Um, so again, like I said, that there are different ways of dealing with the virus. Thank you. Okay. Is there any reason? Is there any reason for the low mortality rate in India for this virus compared to the rest of the world? We still don't have sufficient data to actually. Uh, that's been the speculation that's been in the air for a while that uh, the mortality rate in India is lower. We still don't have very firm data, primarily because, um, primarily because of two things. One is people are talking about comorbidity. Now, if somebody is infected, somebody who had a heart disease, let's say, becomes infected and dies, did that person die because of the pre-existing heart disease or because of the infection? So if you count it in heart disease, then you are actually lowering the mortality rate due to the infection. If you count it in the infection, then you are well, you're counting it in the infection, attributing that to attributing that death to mortality rate by the infection. So yes. it, there are differences in counting, also the denominator also. So it's a ratio of two things, number of people who are dying compared to the number of people who are infected. Um, so the, both the numerator and the denominator are being defined differently. And that's the reason why um, there are, there are uh, you know, people, people don't, don't completely agree or absolutely. Uh, not everybody agrees that the mortality rate in India is low. So uh, we still need to wait for some time to get the uh, normalized mortality rate across Absolutely. the world. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Uh, another, another question is... Incidentally, that, let, me, let me also, having said that, let me also complete the, the next part, which is that if you compare India's demography 
with the demography of another uh, country, India's demography is more favorable. In what sense? Because we already know that these uh, people who are more prone to death, people who have higher mortality are people in older ages. And I told you that people in older ages um, have other, their immune system is uh, not, not so active. They also have probably, they're also hypertensive and therefore they're on uh, ACE inhibitors and all of this. Th those promote infection and they uh, are more prone to death. Uh, while uh, younger people are less prone to death even if they get infected. So India's uh, demography is a bit bottom heavy in the sense that we have a much larger number of proportion of younger people compared to many other nations such as Italy or America. So we have in some ways uh, it's, it's favorable. It works in our favor that there will be lesser mortality compared to other uh, countries such as, uh, US, such as US or Europe. Okay, so um, there is another interesting question that, I mean, uh, what is the possibility of spreading this virus from the dead body? That a lot of restrictions have been imposed, that post-mortem cannot be done. We recently, we came across one uh, video also that in Italy, they violated that post-mortem. They did some post-mortem and then found that this virus can be treated with some aspirin type of tablets or something like that. So. I don't know about aspirin, but the virus, even if the individual is dead, the virus lives for a while uh, inside the cells of the host for a while, uh, not for very long, but for a while. Therefore, care must be exercised, caution must be exercised in handling the dead body. So, indeed, that is true because the virus is able to live for uh, some more time in the cells of the, of the host, even if the host is uh, technically dead. Okay. So, uh what uh, somebody says, Srija says that, what does the death of a virus mean? Uh, death of a virus, because the virus is a non-living entity. If the virus cannot find another host cell to replicate, where it can replicate, the virus dies. Okay. So we say that uh, somebody is dead if that person cannot procreate. Yeah. Uh, so that, that, that's what the definition is. Um, uh, Manisha is saying, do all subtypes of the virus anchor and enter the pneumocytes in the same way? Yes, 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 yes. Except that their efficiencies are different. Yes. Yes. Okay, Omorto has given some references that yeah. did, did you get uh, the similarity of HIV and uh, 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 SARS-CoV-2. So That's I okay. think, I think, it is uh, advisable that Amartya can email uh, to Professor Parthapati Mojumdar so that he can communicate by over email. Sure, sure. If, uh, if submitted. Happy to do that. So Amartya, you please collect the email ID from Obhijit and please email uh, him. Yeah, sure, sure. So uh, somebody, uh, Tushar Pal, is hard immunity even feasible in today's overpopulated world. Is it possible? What about the Swedish model? The, Mr. Shubankar Vishwasar was asking that if you can comment on Swedish model. I've already commented that it yes. is a complete failure. So hard you immunity know? is not advisable. Of course it is the, the only way to survive. There is no other choice. But it has to be regulated. You right. just so what Sweden has done is just didn't even bother about any lockdown, so it spread, and their health management system was not geared to that. Something that happened to Italy, but not Sweden announced that they are not going to do, uh, not going to, uh, you know, do lockdown. Uh, Italy did not announce, but then people are dying on the streets. USA did not enforce lockdown as much. So on, you know, yesterday or day before yesterday was the Fourth of July weekend. And if you saw the pictures of the beaches in Florida and uh, you know uh, California, uh, you see what happened now. Uh, there's a huge spike uh, in, in Florida. Yes. So, yeah. So those are um, uh, reg regulated lockdown is good. So what is your what is your overall opinion about us our scenario in West Bengal? It's going to last? Oh, West Bengal. I don't know, but at least in India, it's going to last a long time. Let's all be prepared for it. It's and going to last a long time. Most of us will get infected. Most of us will uh, overcome the infection and be able to live happily over ever after. Some of yes. us elderly people will probably kick the bucket. What can we do? 
Yes. So that my aerosol concept today morning I was listening to one report that uh, around 239 scientists all over the world has approached to. Um, I've alluded to that. Approach the yeah. Yes. So what should that uh, the, those uh, mask is not going to protect? Maybe if the aerosol is there. No. So and we need to travel in the buses. What do you suggest? Which one is better? That's a normal bus. Given the other situation. Other conditions uh, constant the normal bus or AC bus? I have. <laughs> I'm not an expert on these. How can I make this <laughs> announcement? Very I have no, no, question. I can't. Yeah. So, is there any other question? I don't. And my last question is what did you say about uh, co vaccine? The vaccine will come. Vaccine will come. There's uh, enormous, I mean, frantic uh, search for vaccine and it will come. For sure. When I can't predict. Uh, can it that's, that's a prediction is very important actually. When when will it come? We do not know. Is it we possible by August? Absolutely it... possible. Absolutely possible. Yeah. And please quote me on this. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I, I think it takes a lot of for at least sixty-four weeks. Uh, to complete all the formalities for phase one, phase two clinical trial and all these. Uh, so, uh, since all uh, several companies are attempting for the vaccine in the world, perhaps it will come out, but definitely it will take at least six months. Uh, but, uh, uh, how, how, how do you think, Parthara? Oh, absolutely. I mean, as far as I can tell, again, I'm no vaccinologist. Uh, the vaccine that's most close is the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine. Uh, they are getting into third phase, uh, phase three of the clinical trials. I don't know of any other vaccine that's gotten into the, uh, that's cleared the phase one and phase two. Uh, so I think the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine is um, the closest. We will have to see. They have passed the safety and they have passed the um, efficacy in terms of dosage, which is phase one and phase two. So they are going into large-scale community uh, placebo versus um, vaccine arm, uh, large, large-scale, thousands of people. And uh, they have to wait for quite a bit of time now. Uh, six months is something that uh, I would imagine that, that that's a minimum number of days that they have to wait uh, in order to see if that vaccine works or not. But they are the closest as far as I can tell. I may be wrong, but again, I think that they are the closest. Whether they will succeed, we don't know. It might fail. Even if they were, they are passed, uh, you know, the phase one and phase two, they might they may fail in phase three. Oh, if uh, we do not have any question, then we can thank you, Professor Patrapati Mojumdar. Is there any yeah, other I question? Have a question? Oh, who yeah. is this? I'm Ananya. So I'm my nice question is, so infants have less immunity. So like the senior citizens, can they also be affected severely? Um, we don't have too much of infant data, perhaps because they are protected by their mothers or whatever household. So not, not too much of data is coming out in infants. And so uh, your speculation, your hypothesis may be correct that they are more as vulnerable as the elderly. But uh, we don't just don't have much data on infants yet. And sir, earlier we heard that in summer the virus may stop spreading. What about this? Completely wrong. Quote me on this. This virus will die at uh, at a temperature that we will die before then. So it needs okay, a sir. very high temperature for it to be killed, and we don't attain those kinds of temperatures in the summer. So summer will make no impact on the virus. Sir, I'm Anushree. Um, I couldn't follow what you said um, during your presentation. Does the mutation from aspartic acid to glycine take place in the ACA2, which helps it to anchor better? From aspartic acid to glycine? No, no. The, the aspartic acid to glycine is in the spike protein of the virus. The ACE2 is a human protein. So the aspartic acid to glycine 
is a mutation in the spike protein of the virus, not in the human. Okay, so uh, I think, uh, is there any other question or, uh, anybody would like to ask? I think I think yeah. uh, we have taken almost two hours from Parthada. He's yes. very busy, Parthada. But thank you very much, Parthada, for this brilliant discussion. And definitely, it uh, it was a uh, very high focus about this topic, and we came to know a lot of things. Yes. Thank you. So thank you very much. We would like to conclude now for this session with thanking you all the participants and the dignitaries present here. And uh, I request Professor Muthi Bhattacharya to conclude the session for today. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Shatamurthy. And thanks uh, for Mr. Shubhankar Bishash also, that we could arrange this joint program with the Academic Trust. And Professor Patyapati Mojumdar is always uh, with us. So I'm really thankful to uh, him. I hope we will uh, listen to him very soon again after six months or something like before uh, i think within this time there will be several development in this issue and we will love to listen from Patra again thank you Patra. yeah sure I always thank happy to talk to students yes thank you thank you, thank you.